Hello, welcome to another episode of the Sustainability Action Society and the Capital Club of Dubai. Today, we've got a very privileged guests with us, uh, Mr. Evgeny Garanin. He's the Senior Manager of Sustainability and ESG at the DMCC in Dubai. Uh, he's a person that I've known during the last eight years, a person that I respect a lot for the insights that he brings to the ecosystem of ESG and sustainability practitioners in Dubai. One of the early adopters of the practice, he's put his leadership throughout the last years into evolving and growing sustainability and ESG at the DMCC. Um, and I'll give him the chance to present himself. Welcome, Evgeny. Thank you, Manayam. I'm so honored uh, for this introduction. I mean, you've covered a lot. Yes, I've been in DMCC for the past uh, seven and a half years. Although I did start with the work related to responsible sourcing on commodities related to diamonds and gold. But then I started uh, the sustainability function. I mean, it was started with me and a few other people at that time. So since then, I've been uh, leading it and it's been a big journey. So I'm very happy to share some of the insights and the knowledge of the market uh, and the free zone where I work in. So happy Perfect. to Let's pick up on questions. That. The journey. I like the journey, right? Okay. How did the journey of sustainability and ESG start in Dubai? You were one of the early adopters. Eight years ago, we didn't have this hype. Uh, there were not a lot of events, a lot of mm. talks about sustainability and ESG. Suddenly, regulation picked up really well. Mm. And then we are at a rapid pace today. Um, uh, COP28 is around the corner. How do you leave all this evolution of ESG and sustainability? How were the back in days? Quite a complex question, because at that time, as you said, actually there was no push from the regulators. I think like you are in industry for much longer time, but as per my memory, five, six years ago in Dubai, there was almost no talk. So we have started with the need, um, just a few words about DMCC. We are the largest free zone in the UAE. And globally, with more than 23,000 companies, we are located in GLT, Jumeirah Lakes Towers District. So we are master developer of that district. And we also promote um, trade through Dubai in many of the commodities. So we felt like we have a responsibility to lead and educate our members so they grow more effectively. I mean, there's a logic, there's a business sense. If those members... Uh, having more sustainable businesses, they would stay longer in Dubai and help the local economy to grow. How was the process to convince them of that? Convince the you know, members. That obvious, convince that the, the members. The business case of ESG and sustainability. How was the process to convince them that sustainability and ESG makes us the business? To the MCC or to the community? To both. I mean, the two, uh, let's divide those into two different... Let's start with DMCC. With DMCC, we, the we, have, we had the management that was very keen to onboard and start looking into... I mean, there was no word ESG, there was, but I mean, we were not using it. There was sustainability. Um, so there was a need to uh, embrace best practices. It was not even looked at as sustainability. It was best practices in different areas. But in order to do that, we needed a framework that we could relate to and start, which was uh, quite interesting. Usually you develop a strategy first and then you report on your results. Sure. We started with a report, it kind of happened at the same time. So a report, a global reporting initiative, helped us to frame uh, our strategy and the areas we need to look at. So, so it's very interesting. You started with the report without oh, necessarily building on the strategy, right? It, it happened at the same time. So we had a split, but it was very quick. So it's not like we spent years uh, developing a specific sustainability strategy. It was not even common. You would have a corporate strategy in your company and sustainability like was part of it as like your operations would be would need to be efficient. You would need to align with best practices when it comes, let's say, to procurement or to the health and safety because it's very big uh, material topics for us. DMCC is not a listed company. It's not listed in the stock market, right? Exactly, yes. Back in the days, there was no regulation. Yes. Yet, you've decided, as a top management, to embrace sustainability and to report on sustainability. Correct. What was the trigger? I think it was the desire to lead 
uh, sustainability reporting and having a unique sustainability strategy at that time that you can talk about really enhances your brand. So this is important to understand as a very big element is the brand. But on top of that, uh, if you do everything properly in terms of the process, there's a lot of value that comes out of it, which um, contributes to your own organization, your operations become more efficient, and then you can also educate your community. So for DMCC, it was kind of a no-brainer. It was, I mean, I wouldn't say it was very challenging. I mean, it was a decision that um, we should start um, gathering the data and um, actually we, we hired the consultant. That's how we started. Yes, but obviously back in the days, it wasn't yeah. easy because data is not there. Obviously the organization, it's not prepared for it. So mm. It's something new, it's a new practice as any organization around the mm. world, when they start a new practice, mm. it is a challenging process, mm. right? How did you embrace all these challenges to really achieve what you've achieved today? Can you be more specific? So for example, Otherwise, um, the main uh, challenge that we always, you know, here in organizations that are starting the journey is building the business case, letting the top management understand mm. that these make sense to the business mm. and it makes sense to our stakeholders, mm. right? Mm. So. In navigating that issue, that mm. challenge, how did you embrace it? How did you, what are the steps? Because I'm here very keen to the audience to understand, you know, to learn from the great mm. experience that mm. TMCC has gone mm. through in order to understand how can we learn from this and how can we replicate it in our mm. own organization. So there were challenges at the beginning as any other organization. How did, what were the, the low hanging fruits, the small practices that you have implemented at the workplace in order to embrace this business case and to let everyone mm. believe in the, in, the, in, the, in the big agenda. You're asking a very, very complex question. <laughs> First of all, how it was uh, five years ago and how it is now is very different. Obviously, yes. Uh, so like right now it's much easier because there's so much push from the governments and the audience, from investors, the from the community. And yeah. So at that time, I think it was challenging. I don't think everyone was on board. Uh, the key is to have the CEO and the top, top management on board because stakeholders across the company not always see, um, and I'm speaking not just from experience of DMCC, but from all the companies we have engaged because we have a big community and uh, uh, there's a lot of similar examples of how sustainability started. So yeah, you need a top management commitment. Without that, uh, it'll be very difficult because stakeholders from different departments would usually see that as an intervention into their businesses, into their operations. But if you have the vision that, um, an understanding that there is value to embracing sustainability practices because the organization becomes more operationally efficient, which can lead to saving the cost or eliminating this, the risks, um, various risks. There's Were there so some many. trade offs in the journey? Trade offs? The journey. Yes. Like, for example, you would go to the VP of uh, VP Commercial, you know, mm. at TMCC, and you say, we have to implement a few things, but these few things you can have jeopardize to, there, on economics. There's so much internal work you need to do to be able to discuss you know, privately with which of the uh, members of the top management, because it's different view, the CFO would look at it from one perspective. Of course. So you need to show that it makes financial sense. And this is the most difficult part till today. Uh, it usually goes down to having uh, a lot of benefits to brand value. That's how, I mean, you have to use the business case, but uh, then you, with another member of the leadership team, you would show the efficiency increase in employee engagement or increase in revenue through selling more products because your brand uh, is more transparent. I mean, there's so many different factors. If you going back to DMCC, just one day there was a decision that we need to, as a government of Dubai, be more responsible uh, and have more knowledge internally so we can help our community grow. And we can do it only through leading by example. Great. That's why we're not listed company. We don't have to report, but in order to um, promote those practices and also have the knowledge to, in the end, help the companies grow, we have to do it ourselves. So obviously by, by taking the lead, yes, exactly. By taking the lead without necessarily 
having a regulation that yes. is pushing you to do yes. that, you would play the, the role within your community. Thinking of your footprint, Evgeny, 23,000 members. That's a sizable footprint, right? Mm. So any circular, any regulation you put inside the free zone mm. will impact them somehow, Correct. right? So you can, with, with a small policy mm. inside the free zone, mm. change the livelihood and the impact Correct. of 20,000 members. Correct. Were you aware of this when you started? Obviously, the, mem the, the number of, 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 the, of the clients you know, have grown over the years, but that it's a sizable amount. Mm. So how do you approach this impact, this footprint from the beginning? This is, a, again, a very deep and complex question because, yes, as a government of Dubai, we do have a master developer of GLT specifically. We do have this leverage and the potential to introduce these policies. But we we'll mostly focus on um, those that are related to free zone rules and regulations and master community uh, regulations, uh, which relate either to the way businesses operate from, and we align with the, with the laws of Dubai, federal laws. And I do think we potentially, you know, in theory, can request companies to do more. Uh, but we still look at what the UAE government is requesting companies to do. So I know we can have much more impact by, let's say, asking companies to you know, report publicly on sustainability, but we cannot make it a requirement. Uh, however, we uh, encourage them to do so. For example, in 2018, we have started working with Young Global Compact and they have a sustainability reporting framework called communication progress. It's, yes. it's very simple, but it's, principle. it's quite useful for those that just start the journey. There are some principles you need to submit your um, yeah. um, small report on the website. So we made um, a program where we would encourage any company in the MCC that's licensed by us that reports that would uh, get a financial incentive uh, by receiving at up to 30% discount to the license. So we try to integrate direct financial benefit to them so they become more sustainable. Amazing. Which is quite unique. I don't think anybody has done that. Um, so yeah, that was one way where we tried to do it without making it mandatory. You know, you're opening up a new, um, uh, new corner to the conversation, which is the lack of benchmarking in your industry. Uh, yeah. Right? I mean, so, in, so the, in, in the free zone industry, free zone overall, industry I mean, it's not a problem. Actually. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so usually when a company decides to uh, develop a sustainability strategy, they look at benchmarking, right? Mm. Benchmarking or ESG or sustainability mm. benchmarking is one of the steps mm. that leads to where development I can tell you strategy. how we did it. How did you do that? Mm. Uh, interesting. Yes, we did not have any free zone to look at specifically. But we divided our business uh, when we did the strategic exercise into different pillars, right? If you look at commodities, uh, trade infrastructure, we would compare those to ourselves, some exchanges, some commodity trading hubs. When it comes to uh, managing our community, we look at different, uh, you know, small sustainable districts or large asset management firms um, that manage, you know, a lot of property assets. So when we did bench benchmarking, we looked at a number of companies from those areas. However, we go back, of course, we could have done um, you know, a better job because we had a, a limited pool of those. It's impossible yep. with all the operations of DMCC to look at each and every one. But this is, of course, always an issue, the lack of benchmarking. Okay, so obviously today, um, probably, you know, you you have um, inspired other free zones you know, to kick off the journey. And that's one of the uh, achievements that the MCC has done. Mm. You've done the benchmark and you started setting up the commitments, mm. right? So obviously you, you, do, you, you conduct patriarchy as per the pillars. You've done your benchmark. And then the lack of benchmarking, of course, has triggered certain innovation and certain mm. uh, self-driven you know, inside the organization. Then mm. what was the next step after that? Oh, okay. So you want me to explain it. So uh, I guess the next step or even, I mean, I don't think there's an order in this case. You can do it the other way around, but in reality process, of course, is in my view, the most important exercise a company needs to perform 
which is identifying where, of course, first of all, the different uh, types of materiality. Yes. There's double materiality. There's, we use, but today let's, we let's say, let's say we, use, we use GRI, what we have done. Back in the days, there was no double materiality. Didn't really... I mean, GRI kind of had double materiality. Tended for it. Yeah, which basically meant we need to look at how, in a simple world, what are the topics that are relevant to our organization in terms of us, impacting um, the environment, the society, the out, out, outwards, basically. Uh, these meanings and standards, they do change from time to time. The current one that's today based on GRI 2021 is that we look only at uh, our impact outwards, because in Europe, I think it's double materiality. You also look inwards. And what's important here, like as an example, as DMCC will look at our impact towards, let's say, member companies, but we also need to look a few layers yep. further. Um, how do we impact their stakeholders and their stakeholders? True. And it becomes just like an, almost an endless exercise. We need to conduct so many interviews. And some companies do like a simple um, process, which we did in the beginning, which is surveys and maybe a few discussions. A few years ago, we did uh, 32 hour interviews. 32? Yeah. Wow. 30. And I was the most, of course, you grow. You cannot do it from the start. Of since we've been doing it for five years. Yeah. Uh, you bring certain we, maturity into the exercise. And you learn so much yes. about your organization. And then you can actually focus because you know, it's not like you decide internally. Your stakeholders decide where you should be looking at. Yeah. And you get surprised by the increasing expectation from the you stakeholders. You surprised sometimes, like, I didn't think that was important. Exactly. Yeah, I, li I like that. You know, so every time we've conducted, you know, materiality exercise mm. for one of the companies, we always discover new things. Even the top management and the, the board, they get surprised. Okay, we didn't yeah. even expect this yeah. you know, and the importance of this. Right. So, so what was the result of these materiality exercise and mm. how did that lead into setting up your commitments? I mean, the result was, of course, a list of topics. I think before they were prioritized, now there's no uh, prioritization, it's just a list. So they are all equally important, basically. Um, I mean, you have a list, and then we use a framework, uh, which is called GRI, that I've mentioned before, and we find disclosures, specific data points that we need to um, cover in the report for the um, audience. And this is then a challenge because sometimes you understand you don't have the, all the data available. True. So you start this developing internal procedures, processes, sometimes establishing specific systems in order to collect the data. So first you can, you don't have to have the data. You, you might disclose we don't have it at the time. This is the plan. And you institutionalize you the data it. over years. Yeah. So obviously the set, the set of the data that you had before, it's totally different today. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. in a different shape today. And that shows the maturity and the growth you know, in the system. But how have you invested into implementing a system that tracks this data, that makes mm. it more accurate, that assures you know, good audit and, and assurance over the data? Mm. Um, no, we have not. We, uh, which is quite common, you know, having like a digital system or, you know, like a tool internally. Um, I don't think a lot of companies have it, but I think this is the time actually to do it. I don't think it was, I don't know if it's about the maturity, it was just availability of the tools before. Uh, we have sustainability champions in each department, so they know the requirements, they do manage the data and they submit the data to us which we have to verify, you know, look at underlying documents, and we do our best, of course. Uh, but having a tool would probably save a lot of time. Would you capitalize on AI to help you with this exercise? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think AI is probably, uh, we can talk about AI on any topic, but it's a game changer. Right. Have you, have you thought about embracing AI within the AMCC, you know, to help uplifting sustainability and taking it to the next level? Uh, I mean, we had discussions. I don't think we specifically sat and thought that we you know we would integrate AI in, in doing that. Uh, but I think AI will, will it will just come naturally to our lives at work, regardless whether it's like sustainability practice or something else. But definitely, uh, there will be value. Very good. Going back to the commitments now, what were the commitments that DMCC has put mm. to be achieved 
maybe we're talking about a year of decarbonization, maybe mm. we're talking about a year where we achieve net zero. Mm. The UAE had set uh, 2050 mm. uh, to achieve net zero. Mm. How did the DMCC align with all these mm. commitments? Are you talking now commitments? or in the past? In the or past, and how did this commitment grow over mm. time? Of course, there was um, a lot of developments, like the commit commitments we made before were so different and the framework we use now, I, I feel like they're so outdated at that time because there's so much happened throughout but the time. But they made a lot of sense back to them. At that time, they made so much sense. It was yeah. like common frameworks. Um, in terms of commitments, you know, we, since we're a government entity, we cannot disclose all the information. So a lot of the KPIs, for example, that we have are internal. Um, there's the various reasons why uh, we have certain increase or decrease in um, X, you know, data point. But all these commitments are integrated in our internal scorecard, which different departments uh, are connected to through having objectives. Uh, but those commitments, uh, I mean, publicly in general, would include uh, reducing our environmental footprint. We're currently having internal discussions related to committing to carbon neutrality. Um, across the free zone, across, including uh, members? Across the MCC, no. I mean, going into the boundaries, this is another question. Okay. This is very complex. We are yet to calculate properly our scope one, scope two, and scope three. Scope one and scope two, we, we have. Of course. Uh, but it's not verified. So this is something we're working on at the time. And, but scope three is very complex because all these members, like how, how far do you want to go? And how much leverage do we have? We have indirect impact on the members, but we don't have direct impact. So this is a complex exercise for us, which we are undergoing. So of course, you know, commitments related to environmental footprint, including energy, water and waste, you know, because we do manage all the waste in the community. Uh, health and safety. You know, still we issue the regulations, this construction that we oversee, inspections, all of that. And the, the, the data we publish shows that it's one of the best areas that we uh, are uh, good at. And um, like Uptown, for example, that we just constructed, uh, there was no uh, accidents whatsoever. Um, and we have received all the uh, certifications and health and safety awards for completing, I don't remember how many millions of safe hours. I'm not an expert on health and no, safety. No, it's amazing. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, I think most of I mean, there will be more in the sustainability report, of course, uh, but that's what I get from the top of my head. Very good. Um, let's open up the, um, the topic of COP28. Mm. COP28 is around the corner. Yeah. The whole country, the whole vibe is around that. You know, you hear a lot of companies, you know, committing Mm. you know, to um, achieving certain milestones before the COP28 mm. so they can showcase something. Um, what's your call of what's going on in the market? You know, what do you think the impact of COP on businesses mm. in the UAE? Probably these businesses are your members as well, you know, mm. 23,000 members. What do you think the, in your conversation, in a daily conversation with the members, mm. you know, probably they ask you the question, what's the impact on us as mm. members? What do you think is the impact on businesses in the UAE mm. on COP28? I think there is direct impact and indirect impact. And let's start with indirect impact first. This is the impact from all the discussions that are happening. So everyone from organization perspective and human being perspective feels the need to do more when it comes to sustainability. So it's like a golden age for sustainability experts. Yeah. Everyone is looking at calculating the carbon footprint or developing a project, um, when it comes, like some CSR project or establishing a strategy. So which is extremely good for us. I know it's a lot, a lot of, of it is coming from, again, brand perspective, but the good thing, it uh, has value and impact. Yeah. And I don't think we will ever go back to the way we worked before, since the UAE government is at the center of this. And with um, COP28 and a new reporting standard uh, developed by FRS coming in, yeah. I don't know if there's, will be, if, if there's a commitment later on in the UAE for companies. Uh, I mean, there will be, I just don't know if it will apply to all, all yeah. companies or just publicly listed companies, but we'll, we'll see a lot of push. And in terms of direct 
impact is those companies that already have um, you know strategies and projects in place they are connecting it to cop 28 and they're investing even more to uh, further enhance those projects and showcase them and also show how UAE can lead because you know there's some claims that there's, you know it's the oil economy but you cannot transition and I don't think even you should because oil is an essential part of course of the world economy so but if you use uh, it for the benefit and then uh, diversify which is what we actually need and gradually diversify totally. and investing in the alternative economy correct then so I think it's really important that it happens uh, here in the country great one of the trends that I'm seeing globally, um, uh, and to conclude with this, um, I want to pick your brain on the uh, issue of greenwashing. Mm -hmm. With any topic where we have a hype around one topic globally, mm. uh, you will see misbehaviors. You will mm. see people, you know, uh, using it wrongly. And yeah. then one of the big enough topic around the world, which is the greenwashing, right? Yeah. Uh, we see a lot of claims, but not necessarily our, these claims are genuine. Mm. So. What's your advice to businesses so they don't rush to put all these claims and commitments yeah. without really having their kitchen properly organized? Yeah. Um, one word, assurance. Okay. It's like, the, um, I don't see uh, that many companies um, doing assurance. There are a lot, but at the same time, so many reports I read, they are having no verification whatsoever. Lots of, you know, just read the report, it's very nice. Lots of like pictures and uh, great commitment statements. At some point, I'm not saying you need to do it the first year, although I would recommend a company that develops its first report to do an assurance or at least what's called, um, in, it's, it's internal uh, type of assurance, but there is a term for that. An audit? Yeah. In any case, it's when you have an auditor doing an assurance without publishing the results in order to issue you recommendations. Okay. Okay. Um, through that process, you learn. Because then in the end, as let's say it's per, uh, IC 3000, it's a standard, you get a management report addressed to your like, top management, but you have all the gaps listed that you need to address. And those gaps would include everything in terms of your calculation methodology, availability of the processes, procedures, written documents, the way you conducted your materiality process, how you conducted interviews, and then you improve on that. So it has the benefit of you actually becoming really more efficient, not just publishing your data, but also it eliminates a lot of the risks of you saying something that's not the case, whether it's deliberate or not deliberate. Because very often it's deliberate, which what you're asking, you know, when yeah. you're trying to present something. So yeah, I feel like this is going to be a future requirement to, I mean, it is, a requirement to report whether the report yeah. is assured. But yeah. uh, I honestly don't trust the report that's not assured myself, unless it's a reputable brand that you trust anyway. Great. Last notes, you know, throughout the last eight years, you've had your key learnings, and these key learnings are super valuable for any organization that is starting the journey today, right? Mm. If you are to conclude the entire conversation with few advices, that you advise, I'm a new brand, I'm starting my journey. Mm. I've heard of sustainability ESG, I'm trying to build something out of this. Mm. What would you invite, what would you advise me, you know, as an organization to do in order to start building a strong foundation away mm. from the greenwashing and mm. then building genuine commitments that involve the entire organization and take it forward? Mm. Are you talking about a company that has not yet embraced anything on sustainability? Nothing, I'm starting my journey. From scratch? From scratch. Uh, first, you need to hire somebody to establish a team. You know, very often there's a transition as somebody from HR or from marketing. I don't know why it's very common. They become sust leading sustainability function. Uh, I'm sure you should, you know, be aware of that uh, since you approach a lot of companies in the region. So you need to establish a function. If it's somebody that doesn't know sustainability, you educate them, you invest in the knowledge. Then you, if it's the team that cannot operate independently, first you get external support, like a consultancy, but you use that company not to get a deliverable, but to learn. So you work hand in hand. So in the end, in a year or two, you can deliver 
these uh, activities or projects on your own. And of course, involving the top management from the start, so key. Very often there's a sustainability team that's you know, working on the side. Yeah, they do you know, report the results to the management from time to time, but if there's no touch, uh, it's very hard. Like we established the SDG steering committee in the MCC. It's a governance body that reports to XCOM. And then there's a connection to the board. We have wow. a clear structure. Amazing. Uh, I mean, it's been two years with the committee a bit more, uh, but you know, you evolve. So governance is super important. Governance to build is the, the key. It's, it's the most important of all these e of nice. three in ESG. Without nice. the governance, you cannot achieve E or S. Right? Wonderful. Um, our pick uh, from this, thank you, uh, Evgeny. Uh, I think uh, one of the final notes, which is governance is key. You know, you might build very exciting commitments. You might build sophisticated structure for this and you might implement a lot of initiatives, you might get a consultant, you might do a lot of initiatives, but if you don't have the right governance and what goes under governance, of course, the monitoring, the evaluation, the clear role, the job roles and all of that in order to take this to the next level and continuously tracking it and they're putting it in a nice framework. Um, uh, well, thank you so much, Evgeny. Um, this was uh, a very uh, enlightening. This was very insightful. Um, uh, I was very sure that you can you are a person that brings a very practical approach to things. You don't speak theory. And I, I, I like that about you. And I enjoy every conversation with you because you're very realistic in your approach. You know, you don't really speak theories. Um, at the end, um, I want to thank you all um, and looking forward to uh, seeing you again at the next episode of Sustainable Action Society. Thank you.